Hello, and thank you for watching this webinar. Uh, my name is Jared Lopez with Next Generation Trust Services. We handle self-directed retirement plans. Presenting along with me is Dave Van Horn of PPR Note Company. He will be discussing investing in performing and non-performing notes, and I will be discussing how to invest using a self-directed retirement plan, uh, and then we can put the pieces together. Um, Again, my name is Jared with Next Generation Trust Services. We do self-directed IRAs. So an IRA, a self-directed IRA is similar to an IRA account with a Fidelity or a Charles Schwab or any of the bigger banks. It's only the investment types that are changing. The assets that our clients hold are non-traditional assets. Usually these investments are something that our client already knows and completely understands. And these investments are not allowed with your typical retirement plan. What is Next Generation Trust Services? We're a group of local professionals. We're an administrator for the retirement plan. We are hired to do the administrative work and the tax reporting on non-traditional assets held within a self-directed IRA. So we're not a bank. We're not a financial planning company. People ask me all the time, Jared, what's the better real estate market to invest in? They say, should I invest in silver or gold with my retirement plan? Unfortunately, we cannot help these people. We do the IRS and tax reporting for your self-directed IRA. With that, we can also never endorse or recommend anything. So if you've heard of Next Generation through a third party, we are not affiliated with them. We're doing this presentation today. However, we are not affiliated with, with David and his company. There are several types of plans that can be self-directed, and I'm going to push quickly through this because we're going to try to get to Dave's presentation as quickly as possible. There's several retirement-related accounts, which is the traditional IRA, which you do not pay taxes on the funds now. However, you would be paying taxes presumably when you're at a higher uh, age and at a lower income level. The Roth IRA is for tax-free investing. You would be paying taxes now in this current tax year on the investment and the asset. Uh, however, the asset and any earnings from here on out would be completely tax-free. The SEP IRA is for self-employed individuals, and it's the same type of account as a traditional IRA. However, there is a higher contribution limit because you are self-employed. So as opposed to the traditional IRA where the contribution limit is $5,000 for the tax year, somebody who opens a self-employed IRA can contribute up to $49,000 a year. The simple IRA is for small businesses, and there are several employer plans and qualified plans, such as 401Ks, which can be set up to self-direct. We have a lot of people doing that. We have a lot of people flipping houses with their self-directed 401K, and it's working out very well for them. The non-retirement related accounts are specialty plans. The Coverdell, which is for a child's education, and the health savings account, which you need to qualify for, and that's only for medical expenses. You need to have a high deductible plan in order to qualify for a health savings account. And both of those types of plans can be self-directed. So like I was mentioning before, typically with your retirement, with your IRA, you're investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and CDs, and typically you cannot go outside of the plan documents. So if you have the option of choosing a few stocks in column A, a few stocks in column B, that is not self-directing. Self-directing is choosing the investment types. And some of the allowable investment types include real estate, mortgage notes, tax liens, private companies, LLCs, unsecured or secured loans, precious metals. The list goes on and on and on. Some of the 
crazier ones around the office, some of our favorites. Someone wants to, or someone did invest in teak and mahogany trees in Costa Rica. So that individual doesn't plan on retiring soon. However, they purchase seeds to these mahogany trees and a 15-year contract. Once the trees are fully grown, cut up, and sold and made into our furniture, that's when she gets a return on her investment. We also found that an individual is allowed to invest in personal seat licenses and season tickets. Uh, this person wanted to do it for the New York Jets. That is an allowable investment with your retirement plan, believe it or not. Um, the only things you cannot invest in are life insurance and collectibles. So collectibles, things such as art, wine, stamps, baseball cards, collectible coins, uh, are all considered collectibles, so you cannot hold them within your retirement plan, uh, and also life insurance. There are also some restrictions, some people who cannot have interaction or any personal gain currently from your retirement plan. So those people are the IRA holder, the IRA holder's spouse, any ascendants, any descendants and their spouses, uh, fiduciaries to the account, business partners. So these people are disqualified, but what does that mean? So if I own a piece of property with my retirement plan, if I own a house, any of these disqualified persons cannot rent out that house, even if they are paying a fair market rate for the property. They also cannot provide any service to the house. So if I own a property with my retirement plan, my son's contracting company cannot provide any service to the account, even if it's at a fair market rate. None of these people can have any personal gains, which they are getting a personal gain because if my son's contracting company is performing the service, I would have to pay for that service. Uh, so that is a personal gain to them currently out of my IRA. And why should people be interested in opening up a self-directed IRA? It's because of the broader selection of investments that are allowed. It allows our clients to build up a more eclectic portfolio. We don't expect you to move all of your money into your self-directed IRA, but at least have part of it in non-traditional investments. However, you need to realize that this is sort of a hands-on investment. If you're looking for, to put money into the stock market and watch it rise or fall, that that's completely up to you. However, if you're looking to self-direct, you need to realize that it is a hands-on investment. You need to be in discussions with Next Generation Trust Services in order to make sure everything is working for your investment. So that's it. I kept mine fairly short, so we can definitely get Dave in there to speak quite uh, fast. Again, we're Next Generation Trust Services. You can reach out to us at info, that's I-N-F-O, at nextgenerationtrust.com. The phone number here is 973-533-1880. My name is Jared. I, I thank you for, for listening to my part of the presentation. I'm going to pass it along to Dave in one second. Hello, Dave. Are you there? Uh, yes, Jared. How are you doing? Great, great. So I'm going to pass the presentation over to you. Just waiting for you to upload. Okay.
Well, Jared, I want to thank you for uh, at least allowing me the opportunity to talk about notes today. Um, like Jared said, we're not affiliated with Next Generation, um, but we deal with uh, self-directed quite a bit. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Um, probably, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I start talking about is, you know, how we're able to make, you know, pretty, pretty good returns in this market with notes. And one of the things I wanted to point out to, you know, the investors, I'm actually an investor myself, um, is many of us are already in the note business, but we don't really think about it. Um, and the reason I want to point that out is, you know, many of us have a mortgage on our house where we have a car loan, where we have, you know, a student loan, uh, a credit card debt. And if you really think about it, all of those are notes. Uh, there's a promissory note that's signed anytime you borrow money, even if it's a credit card. So you're, we're all in the note business. It's just that most of us are at the other end of the note business. We're the people that are actually, you know, writing a check instead of the folks that are, Receiving the check. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. Um, I don't know, Jared, are you having trouble get, getting the presentation up? So, hello, Jared, are you, are you out there? Yes, I'm right here. Are oh, you okay. having trouble clicking through? Yeah, I'm only seeing your screen. I can't see mine. Okay, hold on. There we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. It should be good now. Yeah, I'm good now. Sorry, guys, for a minute there. Um... Like I was uh, starting to say, is many of us are already in the note business. We just tend to be writing the checks <laughs> instead of receiving the checks. So I, w I, I want to point that out to people because I know when I first got uh, introduced to notes, I never really thought about it very much. You know, at the time I was a realtor and a real estate investor, and I, I never really put much thought into the paper aspect of investing. I never really thought about you know, being the bank or buying a loan at a discount, that kind of thing. So I, I did want to mention that. So some of the things that we're going to cover today is, you know, definitely investing in notes in your self-directed IRA. I, I want to talk about, uh, briefly about private and institutional notes and the differences. I also want to talk about why second mortgages come first. And then I'm going to touch on some of the keys to success in the note business. And um, I also want to give you a hint that, you know, I'm going to be, uh, there's going to be a note workshop giveaway at the end. So by all means, make sure that you're ready to write down a, you know, a web address and get ready to go to the secret page on one of our websites. The, does your 401k look like a 201k <laughs> or a 101k? And, you know, I think about um, my background. I've had a pretty broad background, as you can see, some of the jobs I've had over the years. You can tell I'm an old man and I've done a lot of things. Uh, I often tell people I started out in the paper business in the fourth grade when I went to my mom asking her for a little bit of scratch. And my mom was a single mom with six kids. So, next thing you know, I was delivering the Philadelphia Inquirer at quarter to five in the morning, and I've probably been in the paper business ever since. Um, as you can see, I've had a lot of different types of jobs. I uh, went to college, I uh, was an accounting major, hated accounting, actually switched to management. I uh, got out and I was, I was, uh, I was working as a as working for a painting contractor when I was in college, and when I got done, I was having trouble getting a job in business, believe it or not. So I actually started my own contracting company. Uh, I became a realtor at the same time, and then years later, um, I had gotten hurt, and I switched over to being a full-time realtor. 
And you can see that I've done financial planning, I've sold insurance, and it, it sounds like a lot of jobs, but some of them are at the same time. Uh, so when I was a, a painting contractor, I was actually a real estate agent at the same time. I became a real estate agent when I was 26. I've been actually doing that for about, I'm a licensed realtor for 25 years. But then later on, um, I actually had gotten hurt, uh, sold off my business. I had 12 employees at the time. Um, and then I started to do, become a full-time realtor, property manager, financial planner. Uh, so I had a lot of different jobs. I own a title company. I still today own a title company. And um, I was kind of always on the – I was always on this quest for the great investment. And as you can see, I traded options. So I had done a lot of uh, renovation of properties, invested in a lot of real estate, uh, done a lot of options, trade, you know, all kinds of different investments. And here I am today, uh, naturally, into the note business. So how did I – I didn't just wake up one day in the note business. I kind of gradually over time uh, found my way there, right? So, you know, how did I really get started in notes? And as you can see from this picture, this is the backyard of one of my rental properties. But I'm not really proud of this picture or anything, but you can see what a tenant can do. And, you know, fast forward several years, um, I actually had gotten up to 40 units, uh, 40 properties. And I started out literally with no money when I was buying real estate. I started buying real estate with credit cards. Uh, interest rates were like 14%. I would buy a house with a, you know, I'd write a credit card check out to myself, go pay cash for a property, renovate it with another credit card, move a tenant in, refinance the property, and pay the credit cards off. And virtually I was getting the property for free by doing that. And I probably got my first nine or ten houses like that. Fast forward several years, um, you know, I am a full-time realtor, property manager at REMAX. Um, I owned 40 units, had a couple million in equity. And what I started to do was lending money out uh, to real estate investors. And I'm going to touch on uh, how that kind of evolved. What happened was I joined my local, you know, Philadelphia arena group. I'm from the Philadelphia area. And uh, I joined the National Real Estate Investor Association. Uh, and up until that point, I never really networked very well or did anything like that. And one of the first meetings I went to, there was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Napier, who's uh, out of Florida. And he held a Saturday workshop, and I went and uh, took his thing. And it was all about investing in paper, and I was, like, just fascinated by it. And this is a book he has it's called Invest in Debt. And to this day, we still utilize this book when we're pricing notes and cash flows. And the funny thing was, guess what I did after I saw Jimmy Napier? Nothing. Took the course, studied the book, didn't do anything. And then, you know, I went on and, um, you know, I went to uh, see other note people, too. Donna Bauer, Pete Fortunato. And for the most part, I didn't do much. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, you know... You know, I'm sure you've heard of people that bought a course and put it on the shelf and, and didn't do much. And I think, um, but all this stuff was juggling around in my brain, and later on it would come back and revisit me. And one of the things Jimmy Napier said was, you know, spend 70% of your income, um, you know, contribute 10% to charity, and then 10% to savings, and the other 10%, he said, utilize that on education. And that's kind of what I did. I just kept learning and learning and learning. But you get to a point where it's paralysis, analysis, or whatever you want to call that, where you're just constantly studying. And at some point, um, you know, you got to take a plunge and, and get into something. Uh, at first, for me, it was private notes. And private notes, just so you know, uh, can be utilized as regular money or IRA money. Um, but it, it's really... It's very similar to hard money. And I know a lot of people are familiar with hard money lenders. They lend money to contractors and rehabbers for the projects that they can't get traditional bank financing for. And these hard money loans, and we call them soft hard money when we do it to our friends and stuff. So I was a contractor. I had a lot of buddies that were contractors. And we would lend each other money out of our retirement account. We're out of our lines of credit that were on my apartment buildings, that kind of thing. And at one point, like I said, I got up to a few million in equity. And I would lend money out to my buddies. 
and it was it was a sweet deal. I mean, typical. These are I'm talking about first mortgages, short term loans, high rates of interest, typically 15 to 18 percent, sometimes with points. Um, so a very high yield, uh, very safe first first mortgages. Typically, we'd lend 65 percent loan to value. Um, like I said, I was a partner in a title company, so it was very easy for me to get the paperwork done. Now I'm going to touch about touch on that a little bit. I wanted to actually do a quick case study so people could kind of see what I was talking about. I did. I I was partnered up with a wholesaler. He was a guy that was um, we called him a bird dog. He was a guy that would go out on the streets and find deals. And on this particular deal, uh, he needed a first mortgage for ten grand. Now it's hard to believe he can even buy a house for under ten grand. And this guy used to do it quite a bit. Um, one time I, I, I funded a deal for him. He bought it for twenty five hundred dollars and sold it for thirty two thousand two weeks later. That's pretty amazing stuff. But what I would do is I worked with this um, wholesaler pretty regularly, and basically I was his bank. He would come to me with a deal to either see if I would buy it. If I wouldn't buy it, he would see if I would close on it for him so he could flip it, or he would actually buy it himself and I would finance the financing for him. And this is a particular deal where I actually hold, held the first mortgage, and I, and I still hold this mortgage to this day. And this note was on a twin house. It was $10,000 first mortgage. I charged them five points, so when I sent the money to the title company, they only got sent over $9,500. And his payment on this for 10 years is $125 a month. Now, you can see the interest rate is 15% interest only. And that probably sounds like an exorbitant uh, rate of interest. But you've got to realize, these are commercial. this is a commercial loan. It's on a property. It's not owner-occupied. As you can see, I had a two-point prepay if he paid me off too early because I wouldn't make enough money on, you know, putting all the paperwork together and creating a first mortgage for this guy. You can see the fair market value of this property was $32,000. Uh, so there's plenty of equity backing my $10,000. So it's a very, very, very safe deal. And it's actually on a property. You can see this twin house here. It's nothing pretty or anything. It almost looks like a mobile home. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, you know, I only hold the paper. I don't, and I don't have to worry about maintenance or anything like that. Now, what my um, wholesaler was able to do, this was actually on a property that was in an area that I wouldn't even typically buy and hold property, but I didn't mind holding the mortgage on it. So I don't know if that makes sense to a lot of people. That's one of the advantages to holding paper. You can hold paper on it in an area where you might not want to actually buy and hold a property. And in this case, I used my IRA account. Uh, I lent the money to them. Like I said, I deducted the points out of the money I sent to the title company. And this particular wholesaler rents this property out to a Section 8 tenant. In fact, they're still there. They've been there since the, since day one at $625 a month. So you can tell, you know, even though this guy was paying me a monthly payment of $125, he didn't really care because he's getting $625 a month. So even though I'm charging him this 15% interest, you can see in his world, it didn't rock his world at all, and he didn't have to go down to a regular bank and try to get financing. He was able to just work with me and not have to deal with the bank. So some of the things I just want to point out that, you know, if anyone on the call ever does a private loan, and goes, you can go to a, law, a lawyer or you can go to a title company. I mean, my title company would typically charge 150 to 250 bucks to draw up the needed paperwork as far as a note, a mortgage, a deed in lieu. Sometimes you get a confession and judgment. It depends how well you know the borrower. Typically, I only lent to people I knew. I only lent to people that were experienced. I also went on properties where I knew the property. Uh, I knew values very well because I was a realtor in this county. I grew up in the county. I had renovated literally hundreds of houses in the county. Probably renovated over 200 houses. So value was easy for me to determine. I had the MLS, um, and even if you don't, by all means, get an appraisal, because the appraisal would typically be paid for by the borrower, so there's no reason not to get one. Um, in this particular case, for the wholesaler, I didn't need one. I had all the comps. 
Um, but I knew the borrower. I knew his experience level. Always check title if you're going to originate a loan. You want to make sure you got a you know clean title. You want to have a, a first position loan, that kind of thing. So you want to make sure you you know you cross your T's and dot your I's on this if you're doing a private loan. But it is a great way to do first mortgages. Uh, very safe. Like I said, I would typically only lend 65% loan to value. And if there had to be a lot of work done to the property, a lot, I just want to make sure people know this. You can have the title company cut multiple checks made out to both you and the borrower. And that's what I typically used to do. So in other words, uh, I would send the money into the title company to, so this guy could acquire the property. And what they would do is they would only release enough money to purchase it. Now, as my wholesaler did work to it, like this particular house didn't need work, but some houses do, as they progressed in the work, then I would go down and inspect it, and then I could sign the check over to the borrower. Um, most of the time, I didn't have a lot of issues like that because I knew who I was lending to. And I, I believe it or not, I've never taken a property back. kind of wish I had, but uh never worked out that way. And even if that did occur, it didn't really matter because I, even to this day, I have my own crew. Uh, actually, my oldest son uh, does my rehab. So it was never really an issue for me. But for a lot of people, you know, like I have a cousin that lends money, private money, who used to lend me money, you know, he can't change a light bulb. So it's a great business for people that aren't handy, uh, as long as they do the right homework and put the right uh, parameters in place and the right conditions in place. You can be very successful at this and make very good money. I mean, think about all the hard money lenders out there. They're usually, um, you know, if Instead of owning more properties than they currently own, they start getting into the paper business. And if you really think about a hard money lender, he is in the note business. He's in the first mortgage note business, you know. So next I wanted to touch on a little bit on institutional notes, and that's kind of where I'm at today. And I want to point out the difference between seller finance notes and institutional notes. There's really two note worlds out there. And if, you know, some of the people on the call are newbies, I just want to make sure you understand the distinction. Seller finance notes are, you know, private mortgages where someone originates a mortgage for someone, where they might originate a second mortgage to help sell a property, or where they might offer owner financing when they're selling a property. And so basically, you know, they're seller-originated type loans. Institutional notes, on the other hand, are typically bank loans. And believe it or not, that's the space that I play in today. I started out in the seller finance world doing private mortgages myself. And then, but today I no longer do that. And I'm going to touch on why, you know, today I specialize in institutional notes. In fact, our specialty today is in second mortgages. Now, is investing in second mortgages a mind tip for a lot of people, especially when they're new? And the answer is yes, it could be. There's a little bit of a learning curve. So I want to throw out a question to the audience. One is, if you had a $50,000 first mortgage and you had a $50,000 second mortgage and the property's worth $400,000, is that risky? And the answer is no. That second mortgage in that particular case is almost like a first mortgage. So a lot of times people get stuck on lean position uh, without necessarily looking at all the other conditions that are going on with that loan. So first of all, I want to introduce a little bit about what my role is at PPR Note, Note Academy. Well, you can see PPR Note Academy and there's PPR Note Company. The Note Academy is our, our learning arm, our teaching arm, and our PPR Note Co. is where we actually sell notes and that kind of thing. So. I'm president of PPR, and I actually have three main roles at the company. And my first role at PPR is raising capital. And I raise capital from accredited investors. And just so everybody's clear on what an accredited investor is, it's typically a high net high net worth individual. Um, and what I raise capital do is to go buy pools of mortgages from banks. And... An accredited investor is someone who makes $200,000 a year if they're single, $300,000 a year if they're married, or they have a million dollars in net assets, not counting their primary residence. 
for the last two years, and they anticipate to be able to do that in the next two years. And that's the short definition of an accredited investor. So what I do is I raise capital from high net worth individuals, and believe it or not, a very large percentage of that is self-directed uh, IRA money. I'd say at least 30% of the capital we raise is from retirement accounts. Um, once we raise that capital, the next step for me is I, um, my partner, John, runs our trade desk. John Sweeney runs the trade desk at PPR. He actually does the, the vice president of acquisitions. He runs a data team. They analyze all types of data. And so they go to banks and large servicing companies, and they buy pools of delinquent mortgages in bulk. And I kind of got into this business by accident. I was running a real estate investment group, a networking group outside the Philadelphia area. I actually ran it for five, six years. I used to interview speakers to come down to our group and talk. And one of the meetings, we had a speaker that came out of Manhattan, came down to talk. He was doing a cash call to buy pools of delinquent mortgages. And naturally, you know, I heard the guy speak, and I did the same thing I did when I heard Jimmy Napier and Donna Bauer. I didn't do much of anything. I, just, I said, wow, that's interesting. But my partner, John, did. He invested some money with this guy. He always paid us. And we were like, how is he paying these high yields? And at one point, there was um, probably like a dozen of us or so that talked to this guy and talked him into, hey, why don't you teach us the business, especially the collection side of the note business, and we'll buy notes from you. And that's basically what happened. He ran a pilot program, and he introduced us to the delinquent mortgage business. And today he runs a $2 billion fund, and he's actually about 40 years old. So the guy's been very successful, done real well. And that's how we learned uh, the delinquent note space. So my partner, John, he'll go out and he'll analyze pools of mortgages with private money that's raised. And those assets, we bring them into PPR. And my partner, Bob, he runs the next division of PPR. He deals with our workout specialist who pretty much smile and dial and contact the borrowers on these delinquent loans. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, how come the banks don't do what you do? And, the, you know, the real answer is they, they're they not in the collections business. They're not in the real estate business. They're really in the lending business. And if you think about it, the bank originated the loan, and they're in for the full amount. So typically when a bank's calling a borrower who's delinquent, they're going, uh, you, you need to pay up or you have to get out, whereas our approach is completely different. We've bought the loan at a discount, and our conversation with the borrower might go something like this. Hey, what happened? Where are you at now? What would you like to do? And let me help you do that, and we're going to create a plan, and we'll present that to management to see if I can get that approved for you. I'm your advocate. But meanwhile, legal's moving forward, and if we don't address this, you know, you basically um, – CPR initiates foreclosure on about half the loans we buy, but we actually foreclose on under 10%. It's probably right around 8% that we foreclose on. So you can see that the pressure of the foreclosure uh, pretty much makes the borrower, not makes the borrower, but pretty much pushes them into making a decision, hey, do I want to stay or do I want to go? Because a lot of these borrowers are sitting on the fence. The bank might not have done anything, especially with second mortgages, uh, a lot of the more, second mortgages we buy are under $60,000. Uh, typically, the first mortgages are under $300,000. So a lot of times, um, you know, we it's not unheard of that we would have bought a loan that was three years, five years, our record's 10 years delinquent. Now, a lot of people, when they first hear that, they're like, oh, my gosh, how would you get something like that to perform again? But there's really only four main reasons that a borrower goes delinquent. It's either job loss, medical reasons, divorce, or death. They're the four big ones. And if anybody can think of another one, just let me know. But they're the four that we know of. And typically, you know, when our guys get a hold of somebody, and sometimes that's the hardest part, is tracking someone down and getting a hold of them, our conversations are, are more like this, where we tell stories of other homeowners we've helped. And we might go like this. Hey, you know, I had this family in Oregon. We were able to help them. Uh, they were able to access their 401K, and I saw corporate accepted discounted payoff for their $50,000 mortgage. 
you know, I saw where they were able to accept 20000 Is that something that might interest you? And this might be on a loan that PPR paid ten grand for. So would twenty grand make sense to us? And the answer is yes. Would twenty grand make sense to the borrower? And of course, that's pretty obvious if they're able to write down thirty thousand dollars. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, well, who would, who, you know, why, who would have twenty grand? Well, believe it or not, a lot of homeowners don't know they can access their retirement account while they're in foreclosure, penalty free, in a lot of cases. So a lot of them can do that. Now, they might say, I don't have a retirement account. And our next workout specialist might say this. He might say, well, that's great. Maybe you're qualified for our friends and family program. We had a family in Delaware that were able to actually sell the same loan to their Uncle Louie for $20,000. Now, think about that. Would Uncle Louie be more inclined to lend them twenty grand when he's secured to a mortgage, a secured mortgage that now he owns on a property where he knows at some point he will get paid back or have collateral instead of just lending his niece twenty grand. So you can see how powerful that would be. Now a bank would never do that because that's considered an arm's length transaction. They're more heavily regulated than PPR. So you can see how that could go. Now a borrower might say, you know what, I don't have any friends or family. Well great, maybe you're qualified for a discounted arrears program. Maybe do you have an income tax check coming? And you know, we get all kinds of crazy things. I've seen both titles, and, you know, people can usually come up with at least $500 or $1,000 towards arrears, especially when they haven't paid in years, and they run the risk of losing their property, especially if it's a case where they want to stay and they're current on their first mortgage. Um, now, are there cases where people can't afford it? Sure. And we start heading into those conversations where we talk about seller assist, short sales, cash for keys, those kinds of things. And if somebody really wants to stay, those options don't sound that good. So the first few options I mentioned start to look more appealing. And, that, and you can see how this kind of goes like that. So um, there are ways to get these assets reperforming, that kind of thing. We do get cash out. Um, typically, we get discounted payoffs, you know, close to 15% of the time, that kind of thing. So it, it's a numbers game a little bit. Um, so next, what happens when we get these assets reperforming? Well, my role jumps back in there. Like I said, I have three roles. One is raising capital, and one is note sales. So my job is selling notes, especially reperforming loans. And sure, there's a little bit of a learning curve, and that's why we have the PPR Note Academy. So we do teach this process. We teach how to invest in notes whether they're performing notes or non-performing notes. Uh, we kind of, uh, we know that this learning curve, you know, it, sure, you need some education sometimes before somebody's going to jump into something new. But in all honesty, note buying is like real estate investing on steroids. And PPR kind of wants to reinvent this note buying experience, whether the investor is accredited or whether the investor is unaccredited. You notice that I said investors who come into one of our funds have to be an accredited investor or a high net worth individual. The one nice thing about note buyers is they don't have to be. They can actually be, anybody can buy a note. So you don't have to be a high net worth individual to buy, uh, you know, say a reperforming mortgage. Now typically our reperforming notes, uh, throw off returns anywhere from 15 to 20% range depending on equity and senior lien status, that kind of thing. So it's a pretty neat um, way to get a nice return, especially in an IRA account. And the cool part about seconds sometimes is they're less expensive. And a lot of the notes that we sell are between, you know, five and maybe 30 grand. So it isn't a, a huge sum of money. And a lot of times um, the collateral on a second can actually be better. So, to give you an example, you could buy a first mortgage for forty grand, but it might be on a, a first mortgage on a house in Detroit. Whereas a second mortgage, you might be able to get um, for ten grand, you might be able to get a nice size second mortgage on a four hundred thousand dollar property in Austin, Texas, that's less than five years old. So the collateral behind the note could be a lot better. Now PPR, we buy mortgages all over the country. We own several thousand loans. Um, we're pretty heavy in about 40 states, so geography is not as critical to us. Uh, a lot of people that invest in first mortgages and commercial mortgages, they're very geographic 
uh, oriented. You know, they're, they're trying to buy loans in New Jersey or something like that. So you will see, to us, it doesn't really matter. We pretty much um, invest throughout the country. The other thing is uh, I, we also do pool sales. So we sell pools of mortgages to some investors, and we teach that also. Now, my partner, John, who runs our trade desk, handles the pool sales. On the individual notes, I manage the individual uh, note sales. The one cool part about our re-performing notes is we warranty the re-performing notes. So if a note were to hiccup and stop performing, we actually jump back in at no charge, rework the loan, and if we can't get a re-performing, we actually swap out the bad paper for good paper. And we do that uh, to protect the initial principal investment from the note buyer. So it's a pretty good warranty we have, and I think that leads to our success of why we sell so many notes. It's because we warranty the notes. The other thing that we do is we allow investors to draw down from the fund. So if you're a high net individual, high net worth individual, and you were invested in the fund, um, like right now the minimum investment is ten thousand uh, dollars, five thousand dollars shares, and you know, the returns right now are like running at twelve percent right now. Well, investors can draw down from that. So if somebody had a hundred thousand dollars they can draw down and buy a note. So say they saw a note for sale for $20,000, they can redeem shares and purchase a note. So we do some pretty interesting things with our investors. Um, so, of course, I don't do all this stuff alone. I actually have a team. And today, they're not all in this picture. It's probably a good thing because we have 18 people now, and I don't know if they could all fit in the picture. But uh, we're growing pretty, pretty rapidly as an organization. Uh, we started out in 2007, and we're actually heading into our sixth year, so it's pretty exciting. As you can see, why do seconds come first? There's my lazy grandson. He's kind of, um, he, he wants to start note investing right now. Actually, he has, and uh, he doesn't want to wait. You know, he wants to retire now. So some of the reasons we say second mortgages come first, one is pretty obvious. There's lower price points on second mortgages. To give you an example, a delinquent first mortgage typically runs at 45 to 65 cents on the dollar. Now, are there exceptions to every rule? Sure. Could I get a first mortgage for 25 cents on the dollar in the hood? Sure, you might. But delinquent seconds typically fall anywhere from about 3 cents to about 40 cents. Now, a lot of times, depending on senior lien status and equity. Now, a lot of people, when they're new, they kind of uh, lump all the delinquent seconds into one bucket, but the industry doesn't. There really is about five or six categories of delinquent seconds, and they're priced accordingly. So there's a lot more to it than people realize. There's also a lot more upside potential with seconds because you can make more money. To me, investing in first is risky. Now, when I say that, a lot of times people are shocked. You're like, what are you talking about? Investing in first mortgages is more risky than investing in seconds? And the reason I say that is a lot of times you have more money into one deal. So I'll give you an example. Someone might invest $100,000 in a delinquent first mortgage. All their eggs are in that one basket. Well, I might be able to buy 20 delinquent seconds, and now I spread my risk amongst 20 deals. So even if I lost one note or two notes, it probably doesn't matter because I got a lower price point and a higher yield. And statistically, I'm going to make a lot more money than if I ever bought it first. And in fact, I know that holds true. I know that's the case. And that's why, even though I started out in first mortgages, I, I really don't see myself going back to there because we make so much more money in second space. Now, the other side is there's a lot less competition, too. Now, sometimes you can position yourself into a deal by owning the second. Many a times you'll see a second mortgage hold up a short sale. And what's kind of neat about that is I might be holding up or controlling the whole deal with a very small investment initially into the deal. So a lot I don't know if anybody on the call does short sales. A lot of times you have to get a hold of the first mortgage through with a homeowner um uh, they call it a homeowner, uh, what do they call it? Authorization to talk to the first. When you own the second, you don't need that because you're coming in a different doorway. 
we're a secured lien holder. The first mortgage has to talk to us. And a lot of times that opens up a lot of opportunity for us to purchase the first at a discount. And we can even foreclose from second position without paying off the first, take uh, title to the property with a sheriff's deed subject to the first mortgage. Uh, we also have reinstatement rights. A lot of times we can just bring the first mortgage current and continue to pay on it. So a lot of times investors don't know that you have a lot of these capabilities. And like I touched on earlier, you can diversify your risk among many assets. So a lot of times we can buy, you know, multiple assets for a fraction of the price than we could if we had bought first. So hopefully some of this makes sense. Next I wanted to show you a sample second mortgage that I actually purchased from a buddy of mine, and I did this in my IRA account. And this is actually on a property in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. Um, not a bad house, just an average house, and the payoff on this second mortgage was um, $25,719. I actually paid nineteen grand for this note, and as you can see, that creates a kicker of $6,700 $6,719. Now, the kicker is the difference between the payoff and the note cost. So you can see I still bought it at a discount. The interest rate on the original note was 7.74, which in my world is kind of irrelevant because I bought it at a discount. Now, I bought this in my IRA account. Uh, it was a 10-year loan. I actually still own this note today. And as you can see, I'm getting paid $343 a month. This is a nice 22% return. The other cool part is you can see that the fair market value is $65,000, and the first mortgage is only $25,000. So you can see I'm protected with equity. Now, is it, you know, big mortgage on a big property? No. This is a bread and butter house where somebody's making their payment, and you know what? This lady's been paying me ever since the day I bought it, since going right back into my IRA account. And this three forty three a month just keeps coming in like clockwork. The other cool part is I have a servicer that does the collection for me. So this isn't something where I'm chasing this borrower every month or anything. I use a company out of uh, Anaheim Hills in California. They're called FCI. They're a servicing company. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with property management. When I was at Remax, we used to charge about 8% for property management. Now, I get you can be less than that. But on a $1,000 a month rent, that's like 80 bucks, And you might only be cash flowing, you know, 250 300 a month, and you're selling out 80 bucks to the REMAX agent to manage it. What's cool about NOS is it's $15 a month. Whether the payment's 300 a month or 3000 a month, the payment, the payment fee to the servicing company is 15 bucks a month. The other cool thing is they do all the accounting. Don't send a 1098 to the borrower. They'll send me an interest statement for the IRS for my accountant, and they'll even do uh, late notices, that kind of thing. So my wife loves these compared to me owning more properties because she's like, don't you dare die and leave me all your junk properties. What she likes about the notes is FCI just wires this money right into her uh, checking account and right into her IRA account. So it's a great deal to own these types of performing notes in your IRA account. You have collateral. But you don't have all the headaches of the townships, the tenants, toilets, and all that nonsense. It's kind of boring compared to, you know, trying to manage rental properties. Now, there's nothing wrong with rental properties. I'll probably always have some. But you get the idea. It's a lot easier to uh, manage and note. So, as you can see, everybody wins. So, if you really think about it, this is why we work so hard to build relationships with note investors like you guys. It's because you guys complete the cycle. And I think of three ways to really use self-directed IRA funds to invest in notes. One is, like we, like we mentioned, re-performing notes or performing notes. Um, you can make pretty nice returns. You own the note. You're in control. You have collateral. And you're typically making, you know, 15, 20% returns, that type of thing and you're buying them at a discount, and typically you have those kickers that I talked about, which is the difference between the payoff and what you paid for the note. Some guys will even take it a step farther, and they'll invest in non-performing notes and pools, and they'll actually hire someone else to work them for them. 
they'll hire like their own servicing company, and and they do it in their IRA and they do it with regular money. So you see both. And then the third way is you can invest in a fund if you're an accredited investor. Um, typically, it might be for three years. You buy shares of an LLC, and you're backed by whatever that entity owns, whatever the fund owns, whether they own notes, whether they have money in a bank account, or whether they took a property back and are collecting uh, payments. So there are three ways that I think of that people can partner with partners. So here's some three ways to get started, and I just want to touch on what three of our note buyers have done. Um, this one guy, Ryan, he actually hires someone to work his non-performing notes for him, and he does that in his IRA account. His IRA account actually owns an LLC. The LLC goes out and purchases a pool of non-performing notes, and he has this guy, Bill, who does the smiling and dialing and actually works the notes, and he 1099s that guy, I believe. And then all the proceeds on those re-performing loans go back into his IRA account, and his IRA account owns all those notes that are in, they, we call them mini pools, but they typically spend between 50 and 100 grand, and they'll buy anywhere from seven or eight assets up to about 20 assets. So that's a pretty neat model. Now, Ryan's an experienced guy. He started out in the first mortgage space. He's been a big-time real estate investor a while, so he does know what he's doing. A second guy is Howie. Howie is like a retired dentist, and he invests in real estate houses and he also in rental properties, and he also buys notes. So he just like he's a cash flow guy. He likes the flexibility of owning notes and properties, and he likes the advantages that that brings to him and his retirement account. He does both. He does a lot of notes, especially in his retirement account. The reason he likes it is because he feels there's less liability with the notes than there is in owning actual hard real estate. Now, the third um, person was Helena. She actually invests in our fund, and periodically she draws down and buys reperforming mortgages, uh, and she likes the idea that she has a warranty with those. So no matter what goes, you know, what happens, whether she's getting paid or not, she knows she can replace a loan if it hiccups. So she's in the fund and she buys notes, and Alina uh, likes the idea of owning notes. She used to own a bunch of apartment buildings, and she goes, Dave, one of the problems I had was I couldn't really travel or anything. I always had to worry about my apartment building. But, uh, buildings. But she said, the beauty of the notes is I don't have to worry. The servicer does all the collection. I could be, half, I could be in South America for six months, and I don't have to worry about anything, right? So there's three keys to success that I think about. One is networking, one is education, and one is mentoring, right? So as far as um, networking, you know, we do have a Discuss Second Mortgages group on LinkedIn. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Meetup, et cetera, and you can stay in touch. And our goal here is to build a whole community of note buyers and investors, and we, we literally have over 700 students throughout the country and note buyers. So, we're very well connected. We speak out at Noteworthy in Vegas. Actually, they're coming up. Uh, we, we go out there every year. So we do a lot of stuff online, that kind of thing, so you can definitely find us. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do today is actually give you guys the next step education-wise, and that is to give you a free online performing note workshop. This is something that if you go to my website, it's typically $47. It's like about an hour and a half webinar on how to invest in a re-performing mortgage and what all that entails as far as hiring a servicer, that kind of stuff. Uh, when you do buy a note through us, we actually pay your recording fees. We pay your setup fee with FCI. Uh, that mortgage would typically already be at FCI, and it would just get transferred over to the new buyer. What's cool about that is the homeowner doesn't – it's a seamless transition for them. All, you know, they're sending their monthly payments in FCI, and now there's a new investor behind that loan. Nothing really changes in their world, right? So this is a free course. It comes with an online manual. Um, there's document section. All this is free as my gift to you guys today. You just go to pprnoteacademy.com forward slash secure forward slash gift. And like I said, it does include a manual and documents. Now, what I wanted to quickly show you was a sample reperforming mortgage. This one's currently on our website, uh, pprnoteco.com, and this is in Niles, Michigan, and you can see it's got a payoff of 25.8. dollars 
The no cost on this is 17.9. And the reason I'm just showing this to you as a sample, as an example, uh, the coupon payment is 278, 235 payments left, um, a nice IRR, a monthly. But you can see how that 17.6, that payment of 278, I do want to point out that this does include um, pr principal and interest. So if you notice the potential performing return is like 61,000, that's if you were to get payments for the whole 235 months. Now, a lot of people get, you know, one of the neat things about this sometimes is you can collect monthly payments for three years and turn around and sell the note for the same thing you paid for today. So some neat characteristics to these notes. So you can tell that this is a really a partial equity deal. Uh, the fair market value is like 70 grand and the senior lien is 58. There's not enough equity to back the entire 25 grand. But um, this, we call this like a partial equity deal, and this does come with a warranty. Uh, if for some reason they stop paying, we would actually take this back and give you a, a credit towards another note. And here's a picture of Niles, Michigan. Great note, like I said, a partial equity deal, and it does come with a warranty. So just to, you know, recap a little bit about some of the stuff we just said, if you wanted to find out more about purchasing notes, you can go to pprnoco.com forward slash step one. And this is where you can apply to be a note buyer with PPR. And you can actually go online and sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, so that if you needed information on individual notes, we could send you, you know, a copy of the notes, the mortgage, your credit report, and all that kind of stuff of the borrower. So initially, one time, you have to go in and fill out your application to become a note buyer with us. But once you get through that, it's pretty straightforward. You can go to the website in real time, anytime, and look at notes to buy, whether you want to do it with regular money or your IRA account. If you want to learn more about investing in, in notes, like I said, um, you can go to pprnoteacademy.com, pprnoteacademy.com, and there's some free information on there. Like I said, we're going to actually give you this free course uh, at forward slash secure, forward slash gift. And uh, that's my compliment. So, um, like I said, we want to, you know, get people involved. I do believe in education. I do believe in networking. And, you know, if you need a mentor or coach, by all means, seek that out as well. Um, so, I don't know, Jared, um, if we can open up to a few questions. I don't know how much time you got. Sure, let's take a few questions. All right, if anyone has any questions, you can please chat them in the chat box. Yeah, it's a lot of information at first, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, that free offer. No, I so think it's, it's, so it's about an hour and a half. One. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we have one question that came in to me. It says, uh, you do your own in-house calling to, to follow up on the, uh, on the payment. Is that correct? Uh, do we follow up on the payments uh, as far as one, a re-performing or non-performing? Non-performing, we work our own. Once our notes go performing, we place them with the servicer also. We use FCI as well. Um, normally, we don't have to call because we can check online to see that a payment's been made. They actually email you, hey, you just received a payment. Um, and then you, when you go to their website, you can actually see uh, when they'll be sending a check to you because they wait like five business days to make sure it clears, or you'll, or they'll say the date that they're sending it to your IRA company. So they, you can go online and see it all in real time. So I'm not okay. sure if I'm answering the question right. Um, all right, we'll get a follow up if uh, if that doesn't answer the question. We have a second one here. Uh, just to recap, the homeowner pays the same monthly amount to the note buyer as he did to the bank? Uh, it could be, but normally what happens is when the note's non-performing, we do a new workout. So when someone buys a re-performing note, they'll actually get a copy of the note, the mortgage, and a copy of the new workout agreement, which is really like a loan mod. Uh, so it could be the same payment in some cases, but sometimes the payment's higher than the original payment because they're going towards the rears. 
sometimes the new payment's lower. So there's different combinations. You might have a borrower that was paying 500 a month, and now they're only paying 350 It depends what the workout agreement is. But what you're buying as a note buyer is the new workout loan mod payment. And that's what your returning yield is on. So I hope that makes sense. Gotcha. All right, we'll give it uh, another 30 seconds for any questions. It's a good question, though. I'd like to remind everyone that Next Generation Trust is coming out with uh, a couple of new webinars uh, that I've never done before, so it should be interesting. We're having on October 11th, we're having fraud within a self-directed IRA, and on October 19th, this is a, an oldie but a goodie, a tax lien investing within a self-directed IRA. And both of the links can be found on our website, which is nextgenerationtrust.com slash events. Again, that's fraud is on October 11th, and tax lien investing is on October 19th. I'm still intrigued about the mahogany seeds. <laughs> I, I learn something new every day. Yes, it's, it's interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I yeah, had heard of the sports tickets before. I actually have a buddy that does it with, uh, he's got like 200 Eagles tickets or something. Oh, wow. And they're all, in a, they're all owned by his IRS. Yeah, it's pretty neat. This person that came in about the sporting tickets, they wanted tickets for the Jets, and we told them that him or any disqualified person cannot sit in the seats. And he goes, I don't care, I'm a Bills fan. So, he didn't want any, he didn't want anything to do with the seats. Ah, uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, Jared, I appreciate the opportunity today. Hopefully, uh, you know, this can uh, maybe, mo- no, I don't say motivate guys, but give them a little nudge into, you know, hey, if you want to take the next step, you want to learn a little bit more, by all means, take advantage of the free course. Uh, if you want to look at the websites and see see what's available and how it works. Um, you know, it, to me, like I said, I've been on the great quest for the great investment, and notes has worked really well, and as I get older, I appreciate it even more. Um, I'm actually just finished a rehab on a house right now, and it's just so much more painful than actually working my uh, paper, you know what I mean? So it, maybe I'm spoiled. I've done both. I continue to do both. I'll probably always have both. I'm more into the commercial and the real estate side now, uh, where I like commercial properties a little more than uh, the typical uh, rental properties, uh, mainly because my tenants are from 9 to 5 instead of 24 hours a day. But the uh, the note fit business has been very good to me, and um, like I said, it's it's been very rewarding. And in 07, we only started out with four loans, and today we own a couple thousand. So you can see how it's really grown for us as an organization. So if there's anything I can do, by all means, you can go to the website and ask a question on the website. Um, if somebody has a question later on after this webinar, so by all means, you know, don't be afraid to go to the site and ask a question. And uh, like I said, Jared, right, thanks for everything. I appreciate the opportunity, and I uh, wish you well. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, my contact information is Jared, J-A-R-E-D-L, at nextgenerationtrust.com. The phone number is 973 Eight zero, uh, and if you have any questions on self-directed plans or any questions for Dave, you can pass them along through me, and I, or go to his website. And uh, thanks again for attending. Thanks, Jared. Take care now.